bicentennial poem. They, they will probably never let me back into Massachusetts <laughs> after writing this because um, in order to write it, you know, I, I need to feel some kind of emotional charge about the material, you know, in, in, order, in order to write it. And when I was doing research about, you know, how Louisiana became a state and got admitted to the Union, I was really fascinated to find out that there was a lot of opposition, you know, in the U.S. Senate to, you know, to admitting Louisiana, and that in particular, Massachusetts <laughs> was, was trying to, you know, the senators from Massachusetts were trying to keep Louisiana out. And I thought about my own great-grandparents, you know, all eight of my great-grandparents came over from Ireland to the Boston area and, you know, faced those no Irish need apply signs and, you know, just, you know, horrible treatment and discrimination. So I, and I started thinking about one relative in particular, a kind of legendary family member, and thinking, you know, if only he'd been able to come, you know, to like, the neutrals, you know, the neutral zone. He, you know, he could have been great. You know, it would have fit him, but he just wound up in the wrong place in awful Massachusetts. So anyhow, that's sort of what my frame of mind was when I started writing it. It's in four parts, and I'll, I'll read the numbers so you know. It's for the Louisiana Bicentennial, and it starts with a little um, quote from John Stuart Mill. He says, the worth of a state in the long run is the worth of the individuals composing it. One, Louisiana. Lest we grow sentimental at the date we were admitted as the 18th state to join the Union, don't forget the snub. They did not want us in their private club. They mocked the foreign languages we spoke. They feared we'd trust not president, but Pope. To those Americans, our precious jewel, New Orleans, was a stinking septic pool, a Babylon of drunkenness and vice, of slow-eyed prostitutes and snake-eyed dice. One congressman from Massachusetts cried the rights for which his Minutemen had died would soon be trampled under foreign feet if statehood didn't suffer a defeat. The self-same rebels who had once dumped tea in protest over British tyranny now feared the many who were free non-whites and schemed to rob them of their voting rights. To join the 13 colonies plus four, we heard ourselves reviled on Senate floor. They did not want us. We were different, strange. At times, we wonder if there's been much change. <laughs> Two, the neutral strip. Begrudgingly they gave us membership, but not the part they called the neutral strip, that zone without a flag that stretched between the Union's Calcasieu and Spain's Sabine, a swampy stretch of ever-shifting land where Jean Lafitte's men buried contraband where fugitives could hide from lawmen's dogs and fortunes could be made in fur and logs. The tribe they call the Sunset People tell the first man rose inside an oyster shell to walk that marshy ground where hurricanes smashed all but bending oaks above the plains, where rivers could be false, not what they seemed, and moonless nights were pierced by panther screams. They did not take it when they took the state, deferred the issue to a later date of where the western boundary would be drawn, attracting many a rogue and thief and con, but also bold adventurers who knew no rules could work to their advantage too. Their guts, not Spanish coins or pirates' gold, is our inheritance from days of old. Three, Massachusetts. Here goes. <laughs> At times I think of him, Cornelius Lynch, my great-great-uncle, how he did not flinch to hunt a scrawny little rabbit down on land belonging to the British crown when they were hungry in his native gale. Caught like the rabbit, he did time in jail. 
But then he made some money later on and shipped to Boston like his brother John, who braved the signs, no Irish need apply, to land a job shut off from sun and sky inside a factory that made straw hats. Poor bored Cornelius couldn't live like that. One night, dead drunk, he made a public scene flinging dollar bills onto Foxborough Green. They say the mayor walked him to the edge of town and made Cornelius swear a pledge to not come back. And yet his bones are found next to his brothers in that burial ground. Oh dear Cornelius, how I wish your ship had led you south and to the neutral strip. Your personality would suit this state, unlike that rocky land of snow and hay. And for Lake Charles. Today we gather by the Salier Oak, an acorn seedling, when the Plymouth folk still preached the non-elect like you and me were doomed to burn for all eternity. Their prim descendants didn't want my kin, hard-working, hungry, nor the state we're in, though three years after statehood we would rout the British at the Mississippi's mouth. They say that General Jackson thanked the nuns of Ursuline Convent for their prayers, not guns but rosary beads, throughout the night's attack, credited with turning the British back. We've proved our loyalty so many times. Our sons and daughters slaughtered in their primes on foreign soil to keep the Union strong. We've shared with them our gifts of food and song. And yet, when Rita struck us... Oh, wait. It'll be gone Give it a minute. <laughs> Think the horn's finished? All right. I'll back, I'll, I'll back a minute. On foreign soil to keep the union strong. We've shared with them our gifts of food and song. And yet, when Rita struck us in 05, the news ignored us like we weren't alive. But we grow strong. Our history will teach how, like an oak tree rooted on the beach of the life-giving waters of a lake, we bend with passing storms, but never break. Thank you. <laughs>